Good morning. Did everybody get a handout? Good. So I've got about half a dozen slides or so to share that will work in conjunction with the handout. And this uh, title, Is There Theology in This Masora? Uh, tries to, I don't have an answer yes or no, but I'm suggesting if there is going to be a theology, I've isolated a place, a site at which we might be able to call something theology. Normally we wouldn't think of theology as an applicable term to medieval Jewish scribal tradition. Um, and uh, the subtitle here, An Inquiry into Several Early Gedolah Lists for Vayak Sheveha and Their Interpretation History. So basically, this is the, all the information here. We have the uh, Ketana above, and then the three uh, Sukim wherein Vayak Sheveha is listed. And you'll notice on the, the top of the handout here, the first asterisk there um, re, uh, points to the bottom of the page. There's just three uh, footnotes here. The first one, no Gedola in Aleppo, Leningradensis, or uh, S1. So only uh, Ketana notes. So of course, for the three passages here, two of them are in the Torah, and we don't have Genesis for the Aleppo Codex, so we don't know what Aharon Ben Asher uh, would have you know, thought or written or how he would have organized his simanim. But these are the, the three verses here. Uh, and what you see in the handout are the several manuscripts that I consulted along the right-hand uh, column there. Each row is a, a different manuscript, except for LM from Breuer's edition, um, he has two different, he lists it two different ways, one at Genesis 15 and one at 38. Uh, other than that, um, well, I should say also, the first one, Washington Pentateuch, that's was recently put online. I don't know if any of you have taken an opportunity to study that in high res. It's very beautiful. Um, some of the pages were replaced by later scribes, but uh, much of it is uh, very bright and, and nice looking. Uh, and definitely 10th century, uh, in my opinion. But I was happy to be able to consult that. Um, and it's almost precisely the same note is given both at Genesis 15 and Genesis 38, with the exception of the underlined uh, the chaser, if you, you see uh, uh, in the Koteret column, you'll see a couple places where I have it underlined, uh, indicating lacking or defective spelling. Uh, and uh, that's just a footnote there before I uh, kick into the main paper, is that that, I believe, is a bleed over, or a, what I'm going to call a leak, from a different uh, ketana note for the Hamin, which is also in um, uh, Genesis 15, 6. And that's the note that's in the middle of the three notes at the bottom of the page. I, I'm calling that a copyist error. It's, uh, the, the error occurs in the, the Koteret at uh, Washington Pentateuch in L3 and in the Cairo Codex. And I'm just suggesting that it's leaking from the Ketana note for the um, which if you look at these three manuscripts, right, right, well, not the Cairo, we don't have Genesis for the Cairo, but for the Washington Pentateuch and L3, you see the uh, Vechas right there uh, next to it. And so I'm thinking uh, the only way to make sense of the presence of that um, in the, the note there in the Koteret is by a bleed over, kind of an absent-minded scribe. And so those are the, in, in the third column from the right, you'll see the one, two, there's three different um, uh, manuscripts that have that uh, the chas there. So a little bit of backdrop, how was Vayach Sheveha presented in uh, Greek and Aramaic translations. Um, I found one in Philo, where Philo is quoting Genesis 15, 6, and he uses uh, the aorist here from Nomizo and, uh, and Nomiste, and that's an aorist passive. It was considered. It was considered. The Septuagint uses also an aorist passive, but uses um, uh, a different stem, obviously. Um, elogiste, and this is the one used, for example, in Paul of uh, 
you know, the Apostle Paul's letter to, I think, in his epistle to the Galatians and to the Romans, and even in uh, Jacob or, or the book of James, he cites this also with the aorist passive. So we have a solid interpretation history on the Greek front um, between Philo and, and Paul and James as using uh, the Septuagint, um, or, or in both cases, of an aorist passive, which is interesting. The Septuagint for uh, Genesis 38 and for Samuel uh, don't use a passive. They don't use the aorist passive. Um, uh, Genesis 38, we have Edoxen, Altain, Pornain and I. He, he thought her to be uh, a harlot. So uh, this is an aorist, of course, but it's an active. It's not, it's, so it's a different stem, active. And then for the first Samuel one, we have uh, the same stem that we see for the Septuagint in Genesis 15. And it's also aorist, but it's not passive. Uh, if we see, we have obtained there, we have the direct object in the accusative. So, um, elogisata, and he considered her, or he reckoned her. Uh, so, to contrast, let's look at uh, the Targum Onkelos and Targum Jonathan for 1 Samuel. Um, we have vechashva le zahu, vechashva kenafkat bara, and vechashva eli keita. Ravya. Boom, boom, boom. It's the same exact vocalization for each of these three. And I searched the uh, Vechashva uh, through my accordance of the Aramaic, and these are the only hits. So, in other words, um, the Gimel, you know, the three occurrences, might be uh, something on the radar of it within the Targumic uh, tradition. I don't know, but uh, there is a contrast here I just wanted to point out between the Greek tradition of these three verses over against uh, the Targumic uh, history. Nothing in the Dead Sea Scrolls, so none of those three fragments um, survive from the Dead Sea Scrolls. We do have, if you're familiar with the four QMMT, we do have the, uh, uh, what they call the halakhic letter, and if you do this, it, it, it uses a nifal form. It will be reckoned to you as righteousness, or tzedakah, and, um, uh, and that nifal could be taken from Psalm 106, uh, where it's talking about Pinchas. Okay, so now, now to the main point here of, of zeroing in on these medieval manuscripts. The gimel is fixed by the canon. So the gimel, there's no negotiation among any copyists of the Masoretic material to change the gimel. Um, the only variants you, that you might see, for example, would be, let's say, Aharon ben Asher, or something like the Damascus Pentateuch, which it doesn't, but sometimes it'll say Betorah, right, or Batorah. You'll see, like, uh, so it's conceivable that um, there was a, a Masoretic Pentateuch, let's say, that had at uh, Genesis 15 or 38 a bet with the qualification Batorah, so two in the Torah. So we see that. But uh, nevertheless, I, I'm going to draw on two different scholarly uh, quotes here to move forward. One is from Philip Alexander. And this quote here, is, he's not thinking about Jewish scribes at all. He's thinking about the problem of manuscript variants in the, in the uh, rabbinic midrashim. That's what he's talking about, the problem. And I'll just read this. Many rabbinic texts show high levels of textual fluidity and instability. And the more we probe into the manuscripts and medieval quotations, the more obvious this becomes. Those who copied and recopied these texts did not feel obligated to preserve them precisely as they received them. They were happy to recreate them to meet their own needs or the perceived needs of their time. To them, the texts were living and developing each recopying was a re-performance. So what I'm suggesting is that we, one way to approach these, all these variants that we see on the handout as similar to the fixed fact of the gimel of the three occurrences, but the copyists having uh, flexibility in selecting the simanim to elaborate that in Sora. 
And I parallel uh, Alexander's tech, uh, citation there with something from our classic uh, text here, Introduction to Tiberian Masora. This is Revel's uh, translation. Israel Yavin wrote the number, and he's talking about the elaborative Masora. So this is his section on what is elaborative Masora, or uh, uh, he says here, the numbering of chapters and verses was a very late introduction into biblical texts. We know that. Consequently, verses can only be identified by quoting a word or two from the immediate context. These identifying quotes are known as the siman, the sign, or rather reference. Uh, in the earlier manuscripts, these simanim are short, usually one word only, and seem to be adopt adapted for oral learning and teaching. In late codices, however, see my name are longer so that the verse they represent is more easily identified. So the, the point I want to zero in on here for Israel Yavin is this seem to be adapted for oral learning and teaching. So I'm gonna take Alexander's thoughts about the, the Midrashim being, oops, pardon me, being performances with variation uh, depending on the teacher's aims, the audience, you know, what he wants to point out, with Yevin's observation that the variances in the Simanim could very much be adaptations for oral learning or teaching. So you can see, before, before we go here, if you just kind of skim the page here, um, what we see is... is uh, the, the Koteret is given on the, this is basically I just transcribed, looked all these up <laughs> and, and transcribed them uh, as I found them. Uh, there's two cases, if you look at uh, LM for Genesis 38, is a little bit of a, a wider row there, and the Cairo Codex. And the reason I have those staggered is if you look at LM first at Genesis 38, the, the reason I have it staggered is because we're at Genesis 38. It seems that the scribe privileged that location first. And so the first Siman has to do with, he takes from the Tamar story. That's the first Siman listed, the one that's relevant on the page. Then he lists Genesis 15 second, and then the first Samuel third. So the reason I have it staggered is to try to preserve that order. Um, Different than that is the Cairo Codex at 1 Samuel. First one listed is Le Zona. Second, Le Shikora, and then finally Tzedakah, which is a different strategy of, in terms of just organization because at 1 Samuel, he could use the Hana quote first, but he doesn't. He starts with the Tamar incident then the Hana, and then he finishes with, um, with Genesis 15. So now I'm gonna isolate, zero in, because there's a lot of variant, each one of these is different than the other. But just to, to try to put this in a little sharper contrast, I have here on the screen the Washington Pentateuchs, uh, see the, the full Gedola note, and then the highlighted uh, simanim from the actual full verse. Contrasted below with the Cairo Codex's uh, uh, Gedolah note with the highlighted in red. And then finally we'll get to uh, pulling on the heels of, of Fred. We've got a note from Ginsburg here. Uh, sadly I don't know what manuscript uh, Ginsburg preserved this, um, this uh, little saying here uh, in Aramaic. But let's look at the Washington Pentateuch. So if you see the order, now this, he has the same note at Genesis 15 and Genesis 38, save the vechas, which is only at Genesis 15. So I'm, I'm using this uh, Gedolah note here to represent both Genesis 15 and Genesis 38. But notice, notice that the, the copyist here just simply uses the first phrase of each verse as, this, as his selected simanim, uh, the selected siman for each verse. Contrast that with the strategy of the Cairo Codex to the Prophets, where he selects 
not the first words of the verse, but the object of the Vayakshaveha. I see these as two equally valid pedagogical strategies for conveying information to the user, to the reader. And of course, this is highly speculative because I, I don't know, we don't know their thoughts. All I know is that these are two, uh, they each have a, a, a very wonderful logic about them. The first, Washington Pentateuch, would function very well for someone who, you know, those the people who know the Tanakh so well, you start the verse and they can finish it for you, right? That's the, the, the organizational strategy in the Washington Pentateuch. I'll just give you the first couple words, you know the rest. This is uh, very different than the strategy of the Cairo Codex uh, in that it has a highlighting of narrative content that is not encoded in the Washington Pentateuch's Gedola note. And the, the narrative content is lezona, that was, that was a man and he was wrong and he needed correction. The same thing with Eli, the Shihora. If we know the narrative, he was wrong and was corrected. The third and final given in the Cairo Codex Tzedakah is God himself is, do, is the subject and doesn't need correction. This same uh, organizational, well, almost the same organizational approach uh, of the Cairo Codex is found in the Aramaic mnemonic that Ginsburg preserves. Notice here we have uh, Zahut, now the word order has changed. Um, Ginsburg's mnemonic goes back to canonical order. Zahuta, that's, that's uh, basically the Aramaic translation of, of Tzedakah, right? De, Nafkat Bara, Nafkat Bara is used in for zona, in in different uh, translations, it's uh, you know the woman who went out kind of thing away from her. If you look at Rashi's uh, Talmud commentary, there he, he says it's a, uh, the woman who uh, went to be with a man, not her husband, basically. Um, and then le uh, le ravita, drunkenness. Now. Uh, David, I know you're a big fan of these, and I've, I've, I've learned so much from, from your work in scribal wit. I don't know if you've encountered this particular uh, mnemonic before, but I, I, I'd be welcome to correction in terms of the translation. But the way I took it is the harlot's acquittal concerning the charge of intoxication. The better is the, uh, the righteousness of the prostitute is drunkenness. Oh, wow, is. Okay, I like it. So it's a clever play, but it preserves the... Um, it preserves the order of the, the canonical order, which contrasts it from the Cairo Codex. However, it's the simanim are are the same exact selection. So what I'm basically what I'm suggesting is that if there is such thing as a theology in the Masora, this would be one place where perhaps we could see that, where we have the creative freedom of the copyist to represent an elaborative Masora note, however he chooses, by, by, in the selection of the Simanim. I couldn't find any, there's no clustering of these three verses in any of the classic rabbinical uh, texts, pardon me. Um, uh, Baal Haturim seems to be aware of this Masoretic tradition and he creates his own little commentary. Now this is only, I looked for the manuscripts of Baal HaTurim I could find online. I couldn't find him talking about this verse anywhere when I looked up at this location. I'm suspicious that this is a printed, uh, that, that, that printers kind of create this and put it in his mouth, right? They're using, it's, I don't know if it would be pseudepigraphal or not, but uh, I don't, I, by my own research, I don't think that this is actually a Baal HaTurim tradition. This is a, uh, Manufactured. However, it does draw on the Masora. It says Gimel, uh, the Masoret, uses Masoret. It lists um, the three verses 
And then he, he cites uh, the Bavli Shabbat 118b. We have what uh, Rabbi Yossi said, may my portion be with one whom they suspect, but there is no guilt in him. So that's Misha Hoshdino uh, Toveinbo. Um, and then he says, uh, behold Tamar, through Judah's suspicion of her, she merited that Peretz and uh, Zerach would, be, would come from her and from them kings and prophets. And uh, Hannah, through Eli's suspicion of her, she merited that uh, Samuel would come from her. And so through being suspect of harlotry and drunkenness, it was reckoned to them as righteousness. So that's uh, the printed and electronic version of Bala Turim that you'll find. So this, this approach to interpreting these three verses is the earliest I could find in, in the rabbinic world. And it's a clear, the, the, the posture is that of identifying with Tamar and identifying with Hannah as being accused falsely. But I suggest that there is another theological angle here that we find in 1 Samuel 16. Now, I had thought I could just read the whole chapter of 1 Samuel 16 because it, it really highlights this theological lesson. Um, it's when, you know, it starts out, how long will you mourn Saul, right? And he sends Samuel to Bethlehem to anoint the new king. And uh, so he sees uh, Samuel goes to Yishai, and they, he sees the, the oldest son, Eliab, and he says, surely this is the Lord's anointed. I'm <coughs> paraphrasing here. And this is the response. This is, what, this is from the JPS translation. It says, but the Lord said to Samuel, pay no attention to his appearance or his stature, for I have rejected him. For not as man sees, a man sees only what is visible, but the Lord sees into the heart. And I would suggest that if there's a theology in this Masorah, particularly that of the Cairo Codex and, and captured again in the, um, now we don't know the date of the Aramaic mnemonic preserved in Ginsburg, but um, they both isolate the objects of the Vayakshavaiha rather than uh, some other strategy, that this would be the theology, that um, Lezona, it's a man who needs correction. He, he makes a judgment that's rash according to appearance, and he, he gets checked. Uh, the same with Ailey, he makes a judgment according to appearance, he gets corrected, and then finally, uh, Tzedakah, this is where the Lord himself is the one doing the reckoning, and it, it sticks, there's no challenge. Uh, thank you. Correct. Okay, but the, the, uh, um, the ones in the Genesis could be, the, that error in the Sifut Aser could be explained because there was an error with the Hem in, which is missing the Yud. Correct. So what could be the error in that, the one Samuel text? There's nothing in the line. My thought is that he's, he's a copyist, and he's copying from a written source, and he probably goes back and, and he's... He, it's, that's why I kind of think the absent-minded scribe or copyist for a minute. And he's simply copying a note associated with Je the Genesis 15. That's it's a great question, David. I, that's my only thought as to how you know, a plausible explanation is that he's copying. Um, here, here's a, uh, on the same note, it's somewhat tangential. I, you know, once this, it was just a couple weeks ago they put this, uh, the Museum of the Bible, 
whatever the criticisms are, then they did make these beautiful high-res images available online. So I'm reading through this thing. You know, does anything in here challenge anything I've ever said, right? That I, and I found one page where it's got the same exact Gedola note in the upper right and in the lower middle, the same exact note. And I'm thinking, this is 10th century, maybe Tiberius. We've got a scribe who's at, like, how would we explain the same Gedola note uh, at the top of a page and then repeat it at the bottom of a page? I don't think it was intentional. I think it's uh, absent-mindedness. Um, and so that's, that's my best answer. I'd like to amend my translation of the Aramaic. Oh, good, good. Um, because they're very insightful. The righteousness of the prostitute is her drunkenness. Let me go that's back. What she thinks is her righteousness because she's drunk. That Lamed, I didn't know what to do. Lorab Yatah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Not that I was able to find. Maybe Fred will come across it in his research on Ginsburg. Uh, I don't know. Um, that's one of the things, seeing that library, that picture of his library, it's somewhere, it's, maybe it's somewhere in there, but Right, and we don't know. It could be new. It could, you know, we don't know if it's old or new. Um, the the coterit on there, if it's, I have it in red, it just says the uh, kriya, um, right, in scriptures, and then it says bilshon targum, um, and it's all abbreviated like that. So uh, that's the best I could do is just cite Ginsburg's printed edition on that. Oh, Fred. The photograph is is a, a museum. Oh, that's the. He had a room at the British Museum. Okay. Yeah. So those, those are not his manuscripts, but the British Museum. Okay, British Museum, thank you. Yeah. Actually, you can check uh, the sources of, of this Masra from Ginsburg because uh, it's from the first volume that we give. And the fourth uh, volume of, of Ginsburg uh, Masra is a commentary, but yeah. only the first part, the letter U. Oh, thank you. Maybe, maybe. maybe we could look. Because you know, it's a letter of head. It could be um, in the in the first part. Thank you. Volume. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's the same thing. Because of the volume one of Ginsburg, it is not yet the Jerusalem material, so it's the British material in the museum. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we can check it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will, I would like to know that.